many of you are ready for Easter Sunday? Amen. Uh, Resurrection Sunday. It's of it's, uh, course in March, and we're getting that typical crazy weather right before Easter that we always get. Uh, but it's nice and cool, and we'll have one more little spell of this, and maybe it'll just be a good spring before we start getting on to the getting on to the summertime. I really would like it to be spring first. <laughs> uh, I think we all would agree on that to some point. But uh, I'm going to get started tonight, and uh, we're just going to start in prayer uh, as we as we like to do. Uh, is there anybody that has any special requests, anything we could lift up to, uh, tonight? It's Tommy. Can you repeat that name for me one time? At Stover, okay. Okay. All right. Anybody else have anything we could we could add to the list? All right. Uh, <clears throat> so we've had lots of things that we've been praying for, just continuing to pray for, and I don't want to quit doing that because I know that there's still things. Uh, uh, Doug, we're still praying for your surgery that's upcoming. Um, just praying for some others that have been having some tests and doing follow-ups. We, we, I got to thinking about it earlier this week about, uh, you know, in just the last couple of years, we've had a lot of folks that have had cancer diagnoses that have uh, we've prayed about and gotten good reports and they've been in remission. But just pray that the Lord will continue to go in that way. Um, I got a yes, sir. For sure. No, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 like I said, I mention it often, but uh, uh, we, Caden and I were talking the other day, and he goes, Dad, if I can get through this week. <laughs> you know, he thought he's like, spring break should have been a good enough break, but he has, you know, some other requirements that have been on him for school, UIL competitions and things, and he's like, if I can get through that. You know, so for teachers, I talked to uh, Trina uh, Tolson the other day, and She's like, yeah, we're in the home stretch. You know, not that you, you're, you don't love your kids and, and all those good things like that, but there's just a lot. There's a lot there, and uh, uh, those, those teachers that that uh, do it just because you get summers off, find out real quick that that may not be enough motivation. Uh, you gotta love kids, <laughs> but uh, but I don't care if you work at a school or at McDonald's. You gotta have patience. You gotta have. Uh, encouragement and the Lord can do that for for all for all those things. So uh, we'll pray for that. Uh, Want to again pray for this weekend, uh, not just for our church and our body, but uh, just lots of churches everywhere, adding services, doing things like that. Just again, another day where people are open to that presentation of the gospel, and uh, just pray that that some people come in that need to hear that message of salvation and receive it, because there's nothing more tragic then uh, you hear about somebody who had an untimely death or, or something, they're going through something in their life and you know that they sit out there and they do it without a lot of hope because they don't have hope in Jesus. They don't have hope in His healing or His resurrection. And so we want to pray for those to just to find that hope. And uh, this is a great time. I mean, today is the day of salvation is what the Lord says and His Word says. But uh, we certainly look forward to that day uh, being an opportunity to present them with the gospel. So uh, can we just lift that up in prayer? And then uh, also just speaking of our family that's up in Oklahoma, uh, they've got some uh, just some needs up there, um, uh, personal stuff with jobs and things like that. So just want to lift them up as well. So can we do that tonight? Father, I just come before you in the name of Jesus and Lord, we, we, we've mentioned jobs several times tonight. God, I know that you ultimately are our provision. So God, th those jobs bring forth money. They bring forth paychecks. They, they help supply our need. But God, it's just a vessel that you use because you are our supplier. And God, when we're in that job, you supply patience. You supply peace. You give us a work ethic. You give us uh, uh, the fortitude, God, to put our heads down and, and just do the work sometimes. Even when things get difficult, we don't work for those 
people, those companies, those organizations, but we work as unto the Lord. So God, I pray for that tonight. I pray, uh, Father, that you would bring a special touch and a healing upon those that are struggling with a uh, bad diagnosis. God, I pray for, for Chris and, and for that brain diagnosis, God, to be uh, 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 the tumor be treated and all the things that need to happen for him to have total healing take place. God, I pray for upcoming surgeries, upcoming uh, medical doctor's appointments, all these things that we're facing, looking at us. God, we, we've prayed, and then you've moved. And then we pray again, and you continue to move. God, I, I just don't want us to grow weary in asking, because God, you're not going to ever grow weary of doing what your word says. So God, I thank you for that. I pray, Father, for this body. Uh, God, for all those that are here tonight in the back, in the kids, in the youth, all of our workers, volunteers, Lord, lift them up and strengthen their spirits. And we just give you praise for tonight in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said, Amen. 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 Uh, we're going to be staying in 1 John. Today we're going to start in chapter 3, verse 19. And we're going to be talking about guarding the uh, guarding the word. And it's uh, funny, I asked Robert to, to volunteer for me, so I'll step over here in a second so they can kind of sort of hear you. But uh, uh, I asked him, have y'all ever heard of that game, Two Truths and a Lie? So, so I've asked Robert to tell three things to you, and you're going to have to decide what you think is a lie. All right, so let me, uh, I'm going to get a microphone so that we can hear it on the live stream. So I should have been more prepared, but what's new, right? Look at that. I got a good sound man back there. He's already turned the microphone on. Well, first of all, it's hard for me to, to tell a lie. So hopefully I can uh, fake you out here a little bit. <laughs> well, first thing, just to let you know, uh, probably most of you did not know that I have a master's degree in business administration from the University of Texas. I don't know if you knew that or not. Uh, also, I don't know if you knew, but my wife and I just celebrated 50 years of marriage, December 22nd. And last of all, uh, I am 70 years old and continuing to get older. Which one of those is a lie? My, my bet, or my hope, is that you're not lying about your wife. <laughs> so, so who do you, okay, so the first one was he has, we'll just do a quick poll here. First one was a master's degree in, in business administration, University of Texas. Who thinks that is a lie? Okay, that looks like the strong front runner. The second one was that you've been married for 50 years and you're, you'll be 51 in December, 51 years of marriage in December. Okay, who thinks that is a lie? Okay. <laughs> she would love to hear you say that. She would, but I did rob the cradle. Okay. And then the third one was that he is 70 years old and, of course, getting older. So who thinks that is a lie? Nobody. Okay, Robert, just for the record... All right. I don't have any education. That's what you're saying. <laughs> Nobody thinks you're educated, Robert. So which one's the lie? The first, the, the second, first or the third? Is a lie. The first is a lie. And just for the record, it's it's a stretched truth, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You do have education, but not not from the University of Texas. I only have a bachelor's degree in Midwestern State University. Okay. The yeah. Yeah, that's I, I was like with him until I thought, I don't remember you telling me you went to University of Texas. So, so that's, it's a, it's a game that a lot of people will play. And it's, a, it's kind of a, just to see if you can get your bluff in and see uh, how well you can speak. And so I appreciate you, Robert, uh, putting you on the spot, asking you to lie in church. Uh, that's just, maybe that's not a good game to play, but it's what the book suggested. So... Uh, but in all seriousness, uh, it can be difficult sometimes to sniff out a lie. 
And uh, I think sometimes if you're a parent, you get better and better at it, or at least you hope you do, uh, that your kids don't get better and better at lying, that you hope that you get better and better at uh, just sniffing it out. And, uh, you know, some things uh, start to not make sense. And, you know, I grew up, uh, I've told y'all many times before that my mother was in law enforcement, and uh, she was uh, a, a jailer, then a deputy sheriff, then she did some investigating, and then she went to work for a correction facility called the Rehabilitation or uh, uh, Restitution Center there in Taylor County. And her primary job was managing last chance felons. And so she spent all day talking to people that were uh, often trying to pull the wool over her eyes. And it was always, you know, well, no, no, Miss Barbara, what, what happened was is the reason I was late getting off of work was because, and she, she just had this keen sense of knowing when you were lying. I don't know if she, yeah, and as a kid, I was like, it's not even worth trying. Like, I just, that was one of the things that kept me a little bit on the straight and narrow, even when I wasn't following Christ, because I was like, I can't lie to my mom. She's going to find out. And I, there was a few times where I did, and it didn't take, I mean, not even an hour for her to go, I need to talk to you. Let's go to my room. And what that meant was I was fixing to get a series of licks uh, that I would not soon forget with that leather belt that she used to hold her guns uh, when she was a deputy sheriff. So, you know, she didn't play around. Uh, but she was also five foot five, you know, 120 pounds. So I survived it. But uh, uh, she could have been a lot harder on me had I not been more truthful. And like I said, the reality is, is that we have to guard God's truth. Anytime we're presenting the gospel, anytime we're, we're sharing it, we have to make sure that we are being truthful. I give kind of a hard time, and, and I shouldn't say t- too much about my mom, because she's, not, she's no longer living, she's no longer with us. But something I did learn about my mom is she was a good storyteller. And she would be telling somebody a story and she'd have all these wild circumstances that went around it. And I believed a lot of it because she was a police officer. And I'm sure she saw plenty of strange things. Um, and, and so I would go along with it. But then one time she was telling somebody a story about me while I was there. And it was something, I don't remember, some detail of a, of a baseball game or something. And then she said, and then he hit a home run and they won the game. And I was kind of like, no, I didn't. <laughs> It's like, I mean, I hit a game-winning, I remember I hit a game-winning hit into left field or something that scored a game-winning run, but I didn't hit like a grand slam, walk off, you know, home run or whatever. And I just thought, why are you lying? It's already a good story. Why are you adding to that? And as I got a little older, I would, those stories would just kind of grow and, and perpetuate and, and, and. She had all these things, and, and even after I graduated, she'd tell stories about how I was on the same team with NFL players and how I was just as good as they were. And I go, no, I wasn't. Not, I, I didn't even start on the teams we were on, much less was I anywhere in the same vicinity of them as far as talent. But it gets easy to take something that we see as truth and then maybe try to make it a little more attractive, make it a little more palatable, And it's real dangerous because we see that happening with the Word of God today. We see teachers that aren't afraid to do it. And, you know, we naturally get to know somebody better. And the reason most of you were able to pick out Robert's thing is because you could just kind of tell from his speech, mostly because his other two were a little bit more familiar with your life to know that those were probably true. And then the one that casts any shadow of doubt, like, was it U- University of Texas or, you know, that's the one you go, okay, that's it. Like knowing that there's a lie in those three things, we're able to snip out that shadow and go, okay, that's it. That's why more people could raise their hand. When we're studying today, John's encouraging us to understand that God knows everything and his truth supersedes our feelings, our, our perceptions of things. It's very easy to get stuck in our feelings as the kids say today, getting all up in my feels, right? Uh, uh, Amber likes to say that a lot because I am a person who does not mind burying my soul. 
uh, probably to a fault. And I will talk to her and I'll say, well, I was thinking about this the other day and, and I'll just start saying, and I think that reveals this weakness in me and, and not, I don't do with everybody, but I'll talk to her and, and then I'll get real emotional and she go, I, that just seems too sappy for me. She'll just go, I, I don't want to get in, I don't want to have this conversation because I'm not ready to talk about all that kind of stuff. She doesn't get it nearly as caught up. Now, she can get emotional in the sense that she can get passionate and, and angry or something uh, about a situation, but she doesn't always like to just talk it out, you know. And the thing is, is that we can get stuck in our feelings and we can let our feelings impact how we treat other people. So in, in 1 John 3, verse 19, we talked about this last week about being the children of God. And now it's saying, uh, and by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if your heart condemns us, for, excuse me, for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. He's greater than the feelings that we have. You know, your feelings can really waver from one day to the next. Uh, when, when you get a big stack of bills in the mail on Tuesday, does everybody else's bills seem to come on Tuesday? I get junk mail the rest of the week, but Tuesday it's just like... <laughs> get them every day. If they're, not, if they're not demanding money, they're asking for it, right? But... You know, it, 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 sometimes your feelings can change by the order in which you open your mail. You know what I'm saying? Because you have, oh, look, I got, I got an invite to a birthday party, and I got a thank you note from somebody, and I got a, a car. Oh, then I got a cable bill. You know, even though I work for them, I still have to pay for the cable, right? And so our feelings can get subject to this, and no one has perfect feelings all the time. We go through things in our life, and that's why it's saying here that God uh, is greater than our heart, right? Is th when we say things like, well, I don't know how that makes me feel, or I don't know how in my heart. Like, we use a lot of fleshly um, words to describe our relationship with others, to describe our relationship with God, when really God is greater than those feelings. He's greater than how the flesh inside of us that rises up because of anger or because of sorrow or because of confusion. And it says, whatever we ask, we receive from him because, uh, excuse me, I need to go back to verse 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us the commandment. Just like it says in Matthew chapter 22, that we are to do what? Love God, love people. We can have confidence in God because He calls us to do those things. Right before that, it said that we should follow His commandments. And, and again, we, I think we would all agree that the Ten Commandments has a great intrinsic value if we follow it. It's probably good if you don't murder somebody. You might want to. You might feel like that's the only way you're going to be able to get a situation resolved. We watch a lot of FBI shows, and there seems to be a lot of murder. You know, when we went, when we went to New York, they said there's not nearly as many murders in the city of New York as there is in one season of NYPD Blue. Right? So don't be scared. Like, there's, there's always got to keep your eye out, but there. There's not somebody dying every week. Just, you know, there's not some unsolved murder case all the time. But what they did say is that it's good for us to follow those laws. It's good for you not to covet after your neighbor. There's a lot of things that I, I've seen other people have, and I go, man, I wish I had that. I wish I had that. But when you get to a place where you go, they don't deserve that, I deserve that. Boy, that's a bad place to be. That's why the Lord says that we shouldn't covet after our neighbor's things. We shouldn't step out on our marriages. We shouldn't have adulterous relationships. We could go on and on. 
Obviously, we should honor our fathers and our mothers because it is a commandment with a promise that will extend our lives even when our parents are gone and thinking about the honoring the memory of them. It's a promise from God. Amen? But his, his two great commandments that Jesus himself said everything else hangs on is loving God, believing on his son Jesus Christ, and loving one another. Now he, verse 24, who keeps his commandments abides in him. Everyone say abide. 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 That means to dwell in. How many of you like to dwell in Jesus Christ? If we can dwell in him or live in him, then we're probably in a pretty good place. It says it abides in him and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit Whom he has given us. I apologize, I'm reading a little slow because this is kind of far away and my glasses aren't getting any better. I gotta go get some new ones. But we should we should understand that abide is to live in, and that John's telling us here that we we should remain constantly in that fellowship with Jesus Christ, believing in him, loving one another. Believing in him, loving one another. It it seems like a cliche, like, it, can it really be that simple? But the reality is, is that if we woke up every morning and said, God, today, here's my simple prayer. I believe in you. Help me love my brothers, my sisters. That could get you a long ways. We could pray for all manner of things to take place. We could pray for jobs and and, and th- those bills to, to shrink a little bit when they come in the mail. Or maybe at least there'll be a check in there in the middle of one of them somewhere. A refund. You know, I got we, we were kind of panicking because we got a refund from the county. And my first thought was, what are they going to mess up on my house payment? Because I don't think I overpaid my taxes. But sure enough, I had gone down, you know, and done the homestead exemption. And all, y'all know how that stuff works. And they said, oh, you get a discount. And then sure enough, a few weeks later, I get a thing from a mortgage company. said, your house payment's going up because you didn't have enough money in your escrow. (laughs) I was like, would y'all just stop messing with stuff? But I will admit it was a nice feeling to get that refund check. But we have to pray uh, for all those things. But ultimately, if I can love, then that's going to cover what the Bible says. It's going to cover a multitude of sins. Waking up and having a, a relationship intentionally with Jesus means that we, we not only just think about Him and upon His Word, that we ask for His Spirit to dwell in us. We can minimize what Christ did when we just say, well, He died for us. And that's not a small thing by any stretch of the imagination. But there's lots of soldiers that have laid down their life for you and I. You might have family who, who put on a helmet and carried a gun into battle and never came home. They gave their lives for you just as well, but there's something greater because not only did Christ give his life for you, he resurrected. And not only did he resurrect, what did he say? That when I go, there was still one more job he had to go do. And that was, he says, I'm going to ask of the Father. That he would send you a comforter to dwell with you and be your helper, that help me that you need to be able to walk through all these trials and tribulations. I'll just tell you all, and if you're watching online, great, you get a sneak peek. But the big secret about Easter, the big, the big storm, everything we're going to talk about is the fact that the veil was torn in two. And there's something powerful because... When that veil got torn in two, we gained access to something that, that uh, nobody had. Jesus' disciples didn't have it at the time that they were walking with him. Save for the fact that they were with Jesus, they didn't have the authority or the ability to walk into the Holy of Holies. But we do, not because just because Jesus died or just because he resurrected, but that he had a purpose in all of that and going to the Father and asking for the Spirit to be sent to us. And that's why we can say that when He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. uh, Chapter 4, verse 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, 
but test the spirits to see whether they are of God. We, we really can't believe every teacher who claims to have a word from God. I try to be very careful because I am a, uh, an, analyst, an analytic person by nature. I, I love to watch shows like How It's Made. Has anybody ever seen that show on Discovery Channel? Now, I'm not going to lie. Sometimes, Simon, it just puts me right to sleep. And I could turn it on, and uh, I, it has a specific sound effect that it makes like during the commercials, and it just makes me go... I have a chair that I think there's Novocaine in, and I think there's, that sound is kind of like audible Novocaine for my brain sometimes. But when I can stay awake and I can watch it, when I can make it through, I, just, I, just, I will be so fascinated at how you make a tube of toothpaste. It's insane. I'm like, you mean they, they, they put the toothpaste in before they seal it? And then how do they get the cap on there? And, you know, I just I overanalyze everything. And so then I will get a tube of toothpaste from the store and I will go, ooh, well, look, you can see, you know. And it just, I look at little things like a, like a package of string cheese that I was eating today, and I look at like the date that's printed on there. And I go, man, who invented the machine that prints the date on every piece of string cheese? Don't you know that had to be quite an undertaking to do? I, I, I want to analyze things. And so what can tend to happen is I can go into the Word of God and I begin to analyze things. And the danger sometimes is that you start to see stuff that doesn't exist. You start to make conclusions or draw conclusions that you're coming up with on your own. And I can tell you that there's plenty of teaching that's going on out there because they go, I have this idea, now let me create some evidence to support my idea in Scripture. One teacher that we had in Bible school says there's something called uh, exegesis, and that is when you study the Scripture to see what it means. You, you dig it out, you look at the context, you look at who wrote it, you look at when it was written, you look at who it was written to, and all of those things are powerful for the understanding of exegesis. exegesis. Just like when we can look at a letter, uh, for example, that Paul writes in Romans, and you can go, well, he was in prison when he wrote it. Who was he writing it to? Uh, several different people, not only to the Romans, but to those people that, uh, that were involved with that church or that he had been involved with. And you can, you can take a lot of things from the facts about that scripture. But that teacher also said what a lot of people do is they do what they, he calls isogesis. And that means what can I make this scripture mean? What can I make the scripture mean? And I've watched TV shows where they're guilty of that. I've been in meetings where they're guilty of that. And I've, quite frankly, I've listened back to some of the things that I've taught and thought... Maybe I was, maybe I was deceived. Not, not in some way that I feel like I was, I was out here just, just hawking a truth that was absolutely contrary to the Word of God, but maybe I just misunderstood something that was much more simple than how complicated I was trying to make it. And so we have to be careful. The Word says that we have to rightly divide the Word and interpret it. We have to, to avoid that. So how do we... Do some simple steps that, to try these spirits to see if they're of God. Well, first of all, you should be reading and studying the Scripture for yourself. My hope and my prayer would be that nobody would come in on a Wednesday night and I would say, let's turn to 1 John, and then y'all would listen to me, even though I'm reading right from the Word, that you would go, cool, I heard it, never need to hear it again. My hope would be that you'd go home and say, you know, I'm going to read First John. It's only three chapters, or you know, five chapters in First John. Uh, I don't remember how many are in, in Second John, but there's five chapters in First John. You could read that in a day pretty easily, probably less than half an hour, if you read it at a pretty decent level. My hope would be that you would do that, not to check it off of a list. Because I've been guilty of that too. You know, if you read three chapters of the Bible a day, you'll finish all uh, 66 books in one year. Almost on, the, almost on the nose. I think there's like 1,066 chapters in the Bible, something like that. You can finish it three chapters at a time. Now, they've got one-year Bibles that have it all broke up for you. They have all these things. 
but I've been guilty of going, I'm going to finish the Bible this year and then go and read my three chapters and then walk away and be like, couldn't tell you what I read. It's like one of those uh, manuals I get when I order stuff off of Amazon where it's all in Chinese. And I just have to do context clues and look at the pictures. But we should read and study the scriptures for ourselves. Pray when you're reading God's word that you can understand what you're reading. If you got to start going into Leviticus, I remember I was trying, the first time I was trying to read Leviticus, I was reading in a King James Version Bible, and it started talking about kind and his kind and her kind and their kind. And I was like, what is kind? I had to go look it up. It's just another name for cattle. And, and, and like I said, and, and it was either Leviticus or Numbers, one of those uh, first five books of the Old Testament. But you got to understand it. And what's powerful is that not only do we, can we rely on our, our, you know, our own intelligence, our own understanding. Look, when Matthew and the other Peter, uh, John, all these guys were gathered after Jesus had ascended, it, they, the, the Bible says this about them, that they looked on them and knew that they were unlearned men, but were fascinated by with the power in which understanding they had in the scriptures. It doesn't take a higher education to understand the scripture because we have the Holy Spirit. So we have to read and study the scriptures for ourselves. Another great way to, to divide this, rightly divide this truth, to understand the spirits, to see if they're of God, is to participate in your local congregation so that you can get to know those people that you allow to pour into your life. Now, this isn't, this isn't saying that there aren't preachers on television that are fantastic. And a lot of them are pastoring churches. Look, that, that's going on. That's just another arm of their ministry. I get it. But you have to be very careful because how many times have we seen somebody that we trusted in so much to give us this word? We watched it on television. You know, you sent money. You did all these things like that. And then only to realize that they weren't living their life under, according to God behind the scenes. It's so bad. We were watching a sitcom the other day and they were making fun of it in the 80s. Because this lady decided she was going to leave her church because she found a new pastor on television. That's how bad that is. It's become a cliche. But it's better, whether it's pastor, whether it's me, whether it's Robert. If you know somebody, if you know somebody that's speaking into your lives, that lets you know that there's something to be trusted in what they're saying. That's the power of participating in your local church. If you have a question, and this is dangerous territory, but if you, we get done preaching a message, we don't just expect you to go rubber stamp. That's great. If you go, wait, I didn't understand something that you said. I have no problem. I know pastor does it because he's done several times. They come back and go, can you explain to me what you were saying right there in 1 John chapter 4 again? You said this. And sometimes I go back, now we have the luxury of going back to the tape and going, well, I probably just spoke like an idiot. I, maybe I didn't mean to say that. Or, yes, I did say that, because here in Scripture it proves out that this is true. It's, it's something that, that you can't do that. You can't, I mean, you can write a letter to, you know, name your, your long-distance preacher. You can write a letter to them, but do you think they're going to answer at least if somebody does, it's probably going to be someone in a correspondence team that's going to go, thank you for your letter. We'll take it into consideration. Please include your gift of, you know, whatever for your free resources. Right? I, look, I, I, that's fine. We use some of those resources, so I can't get too worked up about that. But there is something to be said about, you know... When you need someone to speak into your marriage, when you need someone to speak into your children, when you need someone to speak in to your neighbors and your job, isn't it nice to know somebody that actually knows you or at least can contend to know you? It's powerful in your local church. The third thing we can do is find out more about the beliefs of the people you're allowing to influence you, particularly whether they believe the Bible is inspired the infallible and inerrant Word of God. There's a lot of people who like to go to this when it's convenient, but they struggle with it when it's contradictory to their thoughts and their feelings. 
That's why the Word of God is bigger than our feelings. Sometimes <clears throat> people will go, I know Scripture says this, but I think that's when you just go, okay, I'm either going to stop listening or I'm going to go ahead and go on home now. When you say, I know Scripture says, but, you know, this other thing that was written in 1644 says, no, the Scripture is inerrant. It's infallible. And people, the, the, one of the huge moves today is for everyone to go, yeah, there's just been too many people translating it. There's too many different versions out there. Christians can't even agree on what the Bible is and what's the right version and, and what's going on. And, and look. There is some definite fallacies in some of the translations, but I'm not going to call them translations. I might call them paraphrases. Or some of them are, if you read and you don't jump to conclusions, they're telling you right at the beginning, this is not a translation. This is a simplification for a modern reader. I read a, a version called The Good News for the Modern Man. My grandmother gave it to me. And I've said this probably a dozen times before, but I was reading through the chapters in the, the Gospels, and I thought I, I thought I forgot that I had already read it, and I was reading it again, because it's telling some of the same stories over and over in the Gospel. But because this version was so simplified, it was like they just copied and pasted it in each chapter of the Gospels. And I was going, didn't I already read about Jesus feeding 5,000 people? I'm confused. Didn't I already read about Jesus going in the desert and dealing with the enemy. But it was because it was such a simplified paraphrase, it was just trying to introduce me to the story of the, of the Scriptures. But there are people who don't believe in the authority of Scriptures. They'll, they'll take on behaviors that the Bible clearly defines as destructive sins. In fact, if we keep reading on in, in 1 John, it's going to talk about their sins that are unto death. And he says, I'm not trying to classify all the sins, but I'm telling you that there's some of these sins that are going to lead to death. And we should turn and repent from them immediately. But right here in 1 John chapter 4, we, we've already said we're testing the spirits to see whether they're of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Verse 2 says, by this you know that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You know, we worry a lot about the Antichrist. And I, I, I use the term worry, and I don't mean to minimize the fact that we believe we're at the end times. Like, I, I've said this before about this, this eclipse stuff that's going on. If that means that that's the day that everything's going to take place, then I'm okay with that. I'm ready to go meet my father. But if it's not, I've still got to be diligent in understanding that there is an Antichrist spirit. But, but John's writing about it. The Apostle John is writing about it just 30 or, or 40 years after Jesus Christ was here. There's a spirit of people that go, oh, no, 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 no. Because if you believe in Christ, then you have to accept a lot of truths that I don't want to accept. So there's an antichrist that says, man, you know, sometimes it's good to listen to good people and good speakers, but was he really the Messiah? Was he really the person who came to die for your sins so that you all may be set free? Or surely God can't forgive us of all of our sins. Yes, He can. His grace is unlimited. But there's a, 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 a spin that happens. You know, today, we <laughs> it's funny because here's, I think about this again. I've told you all I overanalyze things, right? I can only imagine what it was like. And I really don't even want to think that long and hard about it because I don't know that I would have been a very good one. I can only imagine what it was like to be a Christian in like 1650. Right? I'm out there churning my own butter or I don't eat. Actually, I wouldn't be churning the butter. I'd be out pushing a plow with a donkey maybe. 
I'd be out there doing manual labor and then somehow having to go, but I trust God. And then we'd all come into the house and then there might be one Bible that all of our family gets to share that we'll sit down and dad or grandpa or somebody will read from that Bible and that's just that's our relationship with God. And you fast forward all these for, you know, maybe 200 years into the 1800s and started getting a little wealth build up in America and you have the Industrial Revolution and you start to see people come out of the woodworks that have a background in God, but they're, now they're smarter than that. And they're going to start, they're going to take these universities that were designed to be you know, schools for seminary and, and to teach preachers and to that, and they're going to take them to a different place and they're going to start endowing them with a bunch of money so that they don't have to teach Bible all the time. And then you fast forward to now, or not even now, 50 years ago, and you had, well, what about radio and what about books and newspapers? And you have all these things that could introduce, but now you literally can't go five feet without being close to some device that you could hear some anti-Christ message coming from it. You can be in a train in a city and they're going to have it playing on the loudspeaker because they don't want to use their headphones anymore. You could be sitting at a, at a coffee shop and they've got the, the news playing over here and it's talking about how foolish some of the things that these church people are doing are. And, and my frustration is not with representation of all these, these areas that are out here because there, if you do a census or if you go back and look at our census of our state, there's plenty of people that are of all different races, all different nationalities, all different uh, sexual orientations and all that stuff. And there's all this push to, let's represent that. Let's put that in the media. Let's put that on TV. Let's put that in books. Let's put that. But what about the over 60% of people in the United States that still claim to believe in Jesus Christ? Can we stop making those people look like fools when they're on a TV show or a zealot or something? But that's contrary to the message of the world because the Antichrist message wants to say that it's foolish to believe in something you can't see. But yet our faith, isn't that exactly what it is? What does Hebrews say? Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things that we can't see. We have to have faith. So we have faith that, that the one who has uh, already gone before us is greater than he who's in the world. It says in verse 4, You are of God, little children, and you have overcome them. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You know, this is just referencing again what it says in John chapter 14. It says, They are of the world, and therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. Everyone say, We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. If we can love despite our political affiliations, if we can love despite, you know, how many colors are on the flag we're hanging out in front of our house, then we can love as God loves. Because His love tears down all that sin that besets all of us. There's just some sins that we see and then we go, Ah! Sin! Meanwhile, we're over here petting our domesticated tiger. Right? Thinking, it'll never turn on me. My sin will never turn on me. And then one day, it looks and goes, Ah! Food! Food! Because that's the only way it communicates. Years ago, I watched the Tonight Show thing. And he says, a kangaroo was awarded, uh, awarded a medal of honor uh, for pulling a little boy out of a hole or something. And it was some weird story in Australia where a little boy fell in a well and a kangaroo somehow jumped down there and put the little boy in his pouch and jumped out. It was the craziest thing. And they were like, so the kangaroo was awarded with a medal. And then and he goes, or as the kangaroo saw it, not food. Pretty sure the kangaroo didn't care. It was just acting on some kind of weird instinct. 
But all it tells me is God can use anybody he needs to use or anything he needs to use to get us out of our hole, including a dumb kangaroo. He's greater than the world. What I was saying about all these things is that now we've got all these podcasts, and I love a good podcast. For some reason, I can drive down the road, Doug, listen to music, and it's like that Novocaine. It makes me want to go... But I can listen to people talk, and it doesn't do that, and I don't know why. But I can be listening to this podcast, and they can start saying, well, I know that the Bible says this, but... And I I have to go click, got to find something else to listen to. At Zoe's church, their pastor has been doing a series on Facebook of looking at popular TikTok videos or popular Instagram videos where people say things about the faith or challenge the faith or challenge scripture or challenge Jesus. And he just says, hey, let me just talk about this for a minute. And Zoe Zoe had concerns. She goes, man, that's going to feel like it's you know, confrontational uh, right here before Easter. And, and to his credit, her pastor goes, we got to confront it somehow. So he, I watched a couple of them that had come through, and it, this one girl said, you know, part of my Christian faith, I never read the Bible, I never go to church, and I never, some, one other thing. And he just kind of goes like, er, stop the record. This is not what you call a faith. This is not what you call a, a relationship with God. Because his word says, like what we just read, that all these things, if you're not walking in him, you're not abiding in him, if you don't show love the way he shows love, then you're not of God. I had y'all repeat after me and said, we are of God. So we have to ask ourselves, do we love like God? Do we... Take what he says and apply it to our lives. Are we afraid to? Have we done it like this, like this diet I've been on for three whole days? I do it and I'm, man, I feel good. I feel better. I feel good. And then when I'm not dieting, I'm like, ah, oh, dieting is such a fad. You know, if we applied it to our life and seen it's positive, but then things get a little tough and get a little hard, and then all of a sudden we're not quite as convicted as we were before. Or, or we just don't find that resolve in us. We have to hold to the truth of Christ. Second John, and this is where we're going to end tonight. Jumping over to Second John, verse uh, seven. I told you these were short because Second John is just one chapter, and Third John is just one chapter. But verse seven says, "For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh." This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. For whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. We cannot partner with deception. We cannot accept people again. Oh, well, yeah, I the teachings of Jesus, the teach but did he really come? Did he really die for you? Did he really do those things? You have to get to a place, despite all the the junk that you're gonna hear out there, there's plenty of people. I, I heard a guy the other day was like, Well, didn't this just sound exactly like this Egyptian fo- folklore? And doesn't it sound just like this Greek folklore? And doesn't it sound like all these things? And, and the answer that the preacher gave him was like, yeah, it does. But you know, the story of Christ was never told as once upon a time. This happened. He said, all those stories that you're referring to, first of all, there's not 1,500 manuscripts that back up the eyewitness testimony of what Jesus did. But secondly, those are all told as once upon a time this happened and then this happened. And that's why we have the sun in the sky. That's not what the story of Jesus is at all. And you have to get to the place where you go, I either believe it or I don't. And what this says is that when you believe it, you're of God. And if you don't, you're not. 
There's a lot of funerals that get done. They say, well, they went to church. They, went, they did this. They did that. But did they believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh for you and I? Because it's saying right here, and amongst other places, 1 John chapter 2, Mark chapter 13, Romans chapter 16, if they come to you and they, they don't say that Jesus wasn't in the flesh, then that's the Antichrist. That's, that's trying to get out of... You could look at it as a burden, but I look at it as freedom. Yeah, there's a burden of having to hold to your faith and stay true to the word of the gospel, but it's freedom from knowing that this sin that I've created in my life, I don't have to carry it. It's nailed to that cross. We don't partner with deception. Finally, in verses 10 and 11, it says, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house or greet him. For he who greets him uh, shares in his evil deeds. We're, there's lots of people in our lives that don't believe in God. Or they might believe in you know good values, but if they're pressed, do they believe again? The doctrine of Christ in the flesh. We have to understand that if we entertain that, if we begin to preach that, then we are we are walking right alongside them. Because there's a there's so many people that are finding any excuse that they can to what they can walk. If because if enough people will justify them, then they feel justified, right? That's you know not to not to drum up a bunch of old stuff, but I got in my fair share of fights. When I was a kid, but I can just about tell you and point to every one of them in my mind and go, yeah, but I had a crowd behind me going, are you going to take that from him? Are you going to let him talk to you that way? Are you going to let him take your hat and make fun of you? It was always about how much outside voices did I have telling me that I needed to go punch somebody in the eye. And I've, and I've thought of all those. I've regretted all of them. I almost said most of them, but I've regretted all of them. Because I can really think about those people. It was, always, it was never about me. It was always about how was people expecting me to respond. And I have to get past what, because if you're waiting for other people to verify your relationship with Christ, you might be in trouble. You have to be able to say, I have this relationship with him. Because I believe in his word. We can be confident before God that if we know and will obey his teaching of Christ, that we have a place with him. If you don't hear anything else tonight, know this. If we stay connected to God through his word, through right teaching, through all those things, we can know that we are still in partnership with Jesus Christ through His Spirit, through the love that He shows us. Because as believers, if we're going to have the Spirit dwelling in us, it helps us to understand that this Word is not my opinion. I didn't you know, go write this and then try to have this eloquent thing to convince you today. This is all just right there in the Scriptures. And it's going to be here if the Lord tarries long after I'm gone. And they might translate it and put a little bit more different language in it, but the truth of it is that the only way for us to be with God is to be with Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, I just thank you for your word. Uh, God, I thank you for your spirit that reveals to us the truth. Uh, God, whether it's the truth that we've heard, it's the truth that we've read, God, it helps us to discern and divide those things that are false and those things that are true. There's always lots of, lots of noise. There's always lots of, of pushback against that. Just somebody that will set their feet on the ground and stand in truth. And so God, I ask that you encourage and embolden uh, this church. God, these believers, those watching online or uh, just who are doing this same lesson in other churches across the United States today. God, I ask God, that you just embolden them. And when, like your word says, when we've done everything to stand, that we might just stand, therefore. It's in Jesus' name we pray tonight. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Hey, God bless you. Uh, get here early on Easter. We're going to have uh, probably have some refreshments, kind of like we do on the first Sunday. So uh, there'll be coffee and 